When does cyberbullying start? Does it only happen to teenagers? What we know from our previous section is that the more time spent online, and the more skilled he or she is at using social technologies, the more likely someone is to be both a cyberbully and a cyber target. Elementary students' internet use is usually highly monitored by parents, and this age group is often using online technologies for playing solitary and multiplayer games, or family entertainment devices like the Nintendo Wii. However, social media is branching into this age demographic with sites such as Club Penguin, Webkins, and Panwapa, although child-to-child -child interaction is usually secondary to game features. Cyberbullying begins to rear its head around 4th and 5th grade. By the time students are in middle school, they have likely been involved in a cyberbullying situation, either as a target, aggressor, or bystander. The emergence of cyberbullying behaviors coincides with the onset of puberty. In this section, we'll talk about the adolescent brain to get a little more insight into why cyberbullying is such a persistent concern among tweens and teens. And we'll look at the role that technology plays in the task of identity formation. Any investigation into adolescent behavior must include a look at the culture that surrounds a young person. We used to worry that young people were revealing too much about themselves online. But over the past few years, mainstream culture has caught up to our kids. Moms are blogging about their children. Grandparents are posting status updates on Facebook. And mobile phones are handed out to children as rites of passage. It's not only adolescents that expect constant communication. It's everyone. Our culture of connection and visibility, coupled with the tasks of adolescence, creates a social environment that's primed for cyberbullying. So, how do the biological, cognitive, and social-emotional changes experienced during adolescence impact the prevalence of cyberbullying? Why is 13 the most common age for cyberbullying to occur? Let's take a look at the biological changes an adolescent undergoes. The physical changes during adolescence could probably be described by a number of adjectives. I'll go with drastic. Along with the invisible hormones that begin to surge at the onset of puberty, come the visible weight gain, breast development, and height changes. And that's just for girls. Boys are growing rapidly, too. And all of these physical changes contribute to the sometimes extreme body consciousness that adolescents feel. And it is no surprise that that physical maturation process is playing out online in a very big way. Adolescence is a time when young people look to their peer group for validation. Posting photos of oneself on a social networking profile is an invitation for friends to critique and comment on them. Even though they may focus solely on appearance and not necessarily character, to an image-conscious adolescent, positive comments are reassuring, an acknowledgement that they are noticed and liked by their social group. The downside to growing up online is, not surprisingly, when digital media is used to hurt or humiliate someone by attacking his or her appearance, photoshopping to distort someone's image to look unflattering, spreading embarrassing or incriminating photos or videos, taking someone's photo without their permission. Cyberbullying of this kind hits adolescence where it really hurts. Now let's look at brain development. During adolescence, the center of reason and judgment in the brain, called the prefrontal cortex, shrinks and the amygdala, the emotional center of the brain, takes over. Risk-taking and impulsivity are hallmark behaviors of adolescents because their brains are literally lacking the full capacity to stop and think rationally when triggered by a stressful situation. This unfortunate cognitive shortage of reason and judgment, aided by the immediacy and mass distribution potential of online and mobile technologies, is a huge contributing factor to cyberbullying behaviors. We'll talk about strategies to address this in later sections. Finally, and most importantly, let's talk about the social and emotional changes that occur during adolescence. As I said before, the average age for a cyberbullying incident is 13, and during middle school, students are at the peak of the popularity race. Fitting in and being popular can be some of the most powerful behavioral motivators for the young adolescent. And cyberbullying, or peer aggression in general, can be an unfortunate consequence of someone trying to look cool or be funny, in sum, to meet their social goals. Why would an adolescent resort to cyberbullying in order to fit in? 
Well, because all of us, children and adults alike, share three basic social needs. We need to feel a sense of unconditional acceptance, usually provided by a family member or a caregiver, to know that we will be loved no matter what mistakes we make or flaws we have. In essence, we need to feel accepted as who we are. Second, we need to feel a sense of belonging to a group of friends, to a school, to a community. Hence the popularity of the often problematic click mentality. And finally, we need a sense of control over our own lives, to know that we can make choices about what happens to us. Sometimes it is these desires, these basic needs, that an adolescent who may have a tough time negotiating the turbulent waters of middle school social life can try to achieve in a negative manner. Developmentally, a major task of adolescence is to form a unique identity. Researcher Sherry Turkle has asserted that the technology environment allows for experimentation with multiple identities. Just check out any adolescent social networking profile. It will be customized with themes, songs, videos, and images that he or she likes and therefore defines his or herself by. And the next day, it could all be different. Take a look at this 15-year-old. Her MySpace avatar proclaims, Life isn't about finding yourself, it's about creating yourself. Even tweens are expressing themselves online, creating avatars and decorating their virtual spaces on sites like Club Penguin. Authors Sandra Weber and Claudia Mitchell see young people's interactions with digital media as a model for identity processes, leaving a digital trail of where I was then, where we are now, who would I like to be, and so on. They are labeling these new media interactions, designing a website, creating a video blog, or experimenting with digital photography, for example, as identities in action, constantly in flux in relationship with their changing interests and their audience of peers. Not only are youth digital media creators, they are active consumers of each other's work, launching web-based productions with the expectation that they'll receive feedback from peers in the form of hits, shares, and comments. This public exploration of identity has its benefits. Not only can young people receive affirmation and validation from their peer group, they are developing new media skills. By expressing themselves with digital media, often through trial and error, adolescents are initiating their own learning and in the reflexive process of writing for an audience of peers, are developing constructive critiquing skills of their own work and the work of others. Of course, online expression is not without its drawbacks. Words, images, and other digital media creations, if abused, can become weapons used against their creators or, conversely, vehicles to promote vengeful or hateful motives. So during this time of identity formation, it's important for youth to understand the lasting impact that their online persona can have. Although it may not seem like it to a tween or a teen, words and images posted online today can be regretted tomorrow. Now more than ever, our digital identities are taking on a greater role in how the real world perceives us. It is essential of any digital literacy education effort to instill a sense of protection and pride about one's online identity. As we learned in this section, adolescence is a time of creation, creativity, self-discovery, and expression, but the myriad of biological, cognitive, and social changes can exacerbate online aggression. In the next section, we'll explore social media technologies and take a closer look at helpful tools to promote responsible online behavior.